I'm showing this diagram also because one of the things that um, Mundell ends the uh, article with, he wrote this article in 1999 um, and it's published in 2000 when he got the Nobel Prize. Um, and it's sort of optimistic at the end, if you've read it. Okay, he says, oh, look, we've had this bad 20th century experience, uh, and, uh, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, but look, now we have these sort of stable units. We have the euro, we have the dollar, we have the yen, and we're on our way to maybe having an international monetary system and some stability. We still have volatility, but maybe it's going to be better. Okay? And, and he's sort of hopeful at the end of the, at the, end of the article. And so we can see what happened since, since 2000, um, that in fact there's, there's still quite a bit of volatility. So there's the yen here at the beginning of this period, um, and here's the yen at the end of this period. This is very large fluctuation in value against the dollar, and the same with the euro. Here's the euro here and the euro at the end, there's fluctuation. I should warn you, this diagram, we're quoting these two exchange rates in two different terms, okay? The, the euro, as we did last time, this is just what comes out of this Fed site that I was showing you before. Maybe I'll show you on this side here. Um, that, the yet, that the euro is quoted here as US dollars to one euro, okay? So if it takes more US dollars to one euro, that's appreciation of the euro. So if this goes up, that's appreciation of the euro, if this goes down, that's appreciation of the yen. So these, these two, if there were no movement between the yen and the euro, these two lines should move exactly opposite to each other, okay, um, because of this quoting convention. And you can see sometimes they do sort of move opposite. There's that one there, and there's that one there. But they're not equal and opposite. That's just a little bit of a move, and that's a big move. So uh, there's a lot of volatility not only between these major currencies and the dollar, but also between each other is the point, too, okay. So, you, we do not have a, uh, uh, where there's a lot of volatility and there's still no global currency, okay, which is what he says at the end of this, of, the, of this article in, in 2000. So 12 years later, we haven't moved on very far. And in fact, as I'll come to at the end, um, we have a euro crisis now, okay, and some people wonder whether the euro will even survive, okay. 1999 is when the euro became the euro, okay, so that was, that was a huge moment of hope for the future. Um, and, now it's, and now it's in some, in some crisis, um, and, uh, 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 and you will see also that a consequence of the, of the financial crisis is that there's been some retreat from financial globalization toward, toward national capitalism. So uh, things have retreated somewhat from, from the optimism of, of 2000. <clears throat> Doesn't mean that we won't get through it. Maybe we will. We don't know. We'll see what the future what the future holds. Um, so let me let me uh, uh, just talk about this article. This is a fascinating article, a reconsideration of the 20th century, um, and I I've had this article on the reading list for many years, but I hadn't read it in a while. And so when I was reading it in preparation for today, I realized there's some things about this article that I never quite fully took on board and noticed before. Um, so I want to first draw your attention to that. Where, uh, and I'm going to translate this article into the language of the course, but in some ways it's, it's, it's closer to the course than I had realized. Okay. Um, it's clear that Mundell <coughs> has a, uh, you know, he's, he's thinking about the gold standard as being a good old days, okay? The international gold standard is a good old days. And why was it a good old days? That's the point, okay? It was a good old days because the payment system provided a kind of discipline for uh, individual countries, okay? that the need to make your international payments in gold um, wa wa was a good thing, that it disciplined uh, central banks and it disciplined finance ministries as well. Um, and that was a good thing for individual countries, the disciplining business. It was not only good for, for individual countries, uh, but, it, but it created an integrated system um, of, the, of, the whole, of the whole world. Um, integration and stability because everyone is adjusting their own behavior, okay, to the same discipline, 
Okay? They're all facing the same discipline. And as a consequence, the system as a whole has a, has a certain unity to it. Um, now, this didn't mean, mean that there weren't problems. And, and there was actually some tendency to long-run deflation sometime or uh, because of the value of gold would change um, over, over, over time. But in retrospect, this is, is rather, is rather uh, uh, positive feature of the, of the system. This, is, this all broke down in World War, in World War I, um, and we had this whole 20th century experience, okay, which was quite different. Um, and the story that he wants to tell in this article is that instead of submitting to the discipline, um, countries decided, and central banks and finance ministers, okay, said this discipline is too harsh, okay, and I don't want to submit to it. Okay, and so I would like to uh, get out from under in, in, in some way or other. Um, and so central banks are avoiding discipline, are trying to avoid discipline. So let's just remind, remind ourselves of our hierarchy. There's gold, there's currency, there's deposits. Okay, so it's this connection here, gold and currency. This is where the discipline is. Okay, the central bank is issuing currency that's convertible into gold. Okay, and the central banks are trying to avoid that discipline. One way they could have done this. Okay, this is in the back of his mind throughout this article, um, is to revalue gold. Right? Because the discipline comes from the idea that as we're expanding, as the economy is expanding, currency expands, but gold doesn't. Okay? And so it holds you back. Okay? But if you just increase the price of gold, higher, higher value of gold is like more gold. Okay? So it's the same thing. There's more gold that way. So if you could coordinate and get all the central banks to just raise the price of gold, okay, that would have, and, and, or in other words, devalue your currency against gold, that would be the same thing. Um, you could have relaxed that, that discipline. Um, but it has to be a coordinated thing. All countries have to do this at the same time. That's one way to avoid the discipline. But the, but the countries were not, in, were not able to coordinate this uh, amongst themselves because there were always uh, uh, distributional consequences of revaluing gold. You know, some countries had gold, had a lot of gold, and other ones didn't. Okay, and so revaluing was it would be a wealth transfer, um, and that was always a problem. And you couldn't sort out. Well, maybe the ones who gained could compensate the losers. You know, this is just not the way international politics works. Okay. Another way you could have avoided the discipline, okay, was by creating artificial gold. So this is a quantity thing. Okay. Instead of just inc increasing the value of gold, increase the quantity of gold artificially. Um, and there were some attempts to do that, like with the, with the uh, SDR in the IMF. Okay. But again, too little, too late. It didn't really quite, quite work. Okay. So the central banks are trying to avoid discipline. There are mechanisms th that are always in the back of Mundell's minds that would have worked, um, but they weren't able to find them, and they weren't able to, 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 to get to them. And so as a consequence, um, we had uh, a lot of bumbling around. Um, and in particular, the main culprit in this bumbling, um, it's, quite, it's quite amazing, this story he tells there. The main culprit in this is, in fact, the US Fed. Okay? That the US Fed is a central bank that's also trying to avoid, avoid discipline. Um, but it also doesn't know what it's doing. It's a new central bank. It's created in 1913. It has no history. Um, and it's constantly making errors. However, the US is the dominant country. And so everyone is trying to peg to the dollar. And so whatever the Fed does is what the world does okay? during, this, during this whole period. So that instead of having a gold standard, okay, we had a dollar standard in, basically in the background and, and eventually in the foreground. Dollar standard, but immature Fed. Um, and the consequence was uh, a lot of volatility until the whole system broke down. Okay? So there's the gold standard, and then there's the dollar standard. 
Um, and then there's the floating rate period um, that led us to 1999, when he's thinking that's sort of coming to an end. You know, Europe has decided that it doesn't want to have floating rates among its currencies anymore. They're going to unify. And so it's just going to, he's projecting that into the future. There's going to be more and more unification. Okay. And it hasn't, hasn't actually happened. Okay. So I think this uh, hierarchy of money point of view um, is, is helpful. And notice, notice that we're talking about the uh, central bank and its relation to some international standard. Now I'm going to go through the article in a little more, in a little more uh, detail.